the CNBC app. Global market news in one place. Customizable sections and personalized alerts. Stocks tracking, interactive charts and market insights all in your hands. Stay connected. Stay informed. Download the CNBC app today. It's one of those days when there are so many big stories in politics, in markets, in business. We will update you, and I promise you, over the next three hours, Karen Chan, myself, Steve Sedgwick, will tell you something you didn't know beforehand. Anyway, your headlines. Rishi Sunak and Sakia Starmer locking horns, trading tax accusations in their final televised debate before next week's general election. Keir Starmer is not being straight with you about his plans to raise the taxes. I don't think that's leadership. I don't think that people should surrender their family finances to the Labour Party. He's got a manifesto that's got promises to you and everybody watching which are unfunded because his Chancellor has said that the money he's relying on has already been spent. Here's an amazing thing. How is that chart on your screen not a crisis? Look at it. The yen has now slumped to a fresh 38-year low versus the greenback, sparking intervention, watch and fueling expectations the BOJ will raise interest rates next month. The Nasdaq moves higher as Amazon makes a play for the top, crossing $2 trillion in market cap for the first time ever. And memory chip maker Micron posts an 80% jump in revenue, but its fourth quarter guidance fails to woo investors, sending shares 8% lower after the bell. So many stories to talk about. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Good, good, good. I mean, we're talking about the 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 the, the yen, which is plummeting, and and again, it's it's like it's in clear, plain sight. How is that not? A crisis at the moment. It seems quite extraordinary as well. You've got the UK political story, which we've got Carsten uh, Nickel waiting in the wings. I've already had a quick chat with him about this as well. Uh, so much going on. US consumer, amazing talking points there as well. Lots going yeah, on. Yeah, a lot of AI world. We just mentioned the headlines around Amazon finally getting to a very strong market cap, yeah. the two trillion mark. Nvidia with the day GM. So I think there's been a lot around the AI news front, and YouTube also going after some sort of AI generated content. Yeah, there's been a lot of AI the space overnight. Artists get paid. That's that's what I want to know. Here's the thing. Do, I, we, we're obsessed by these round numbers. Does it, do any of you like actually care? We care in media because we say three trillion Amazon. Oh, sorry, two trillion Amazon. Three trillion Apple. Oh, NVIDIA, three trillion. Oh, NVIDIA, not three trillion. Does anyone actually care about these round numbers apart from the media? Well, we haven't been talking about the trillion dollar mark that yeah. much, right? But now it seems to be the new benchmark. It's like when we matter? got to the billions and then billions yeah. just became sort of a, a whatever number. I Do think you, it, it matters from that I'll sense. I'll go back in ancient history. I remember when we used to talk about what would be the first trillion dollar US company. This is way before you joined, CMB, or joined us in Europe as well and, and you made up our fantastic team. Do you know the stock that everyone used to say? I remember full clearly. It wasn't Apple, it would have been pre-Apple no, days. No, no. An it oil was... stock? Yes, spot on. Oh. It was Exxon. <laughs> get the prize. It was Exxon. We always used to talk about Exxon being the first trillion dollar stock. And mm. You know, look at these names. Anyway, uh, it is my duty, I'm afraid, to tell you that our lead story is about British politics. So if you want to get a cup of tea... No, I'm joking. You stay here. You watch this. A Conservative Party leader Rishi Sunak hit out at Labour's Sakir Starmer over migration, the economy and trust in politics as the two leaders clashed in the last leaders' debate before next week's general election. A snap YouGov poll released after the debate saw voters split 50-50 on who won the night or who lost the night on that basis, uh, when asked to put their political views aside. Rishi Sunak accused Starmer of being dishonest about Labour's tax plans. Leadership means being straight with people about what you plan to do. <laughs> I've set out my plans clearly, and I appreciate, actually, that not everyone's going to agree with me on everything, but at least you know where I stand. Now, Keir Starmer is not being straight with you about his plans to raise your taxes. I don't think that's leadership. I don't think that people should surrender their family finances to the Labour Party, and that's the choice for people at this election. Well, let me just address that, if I may, because we have set out in our manifesto all of our plans. They're fully funded, they're fully costed, and we've set out that we will not be increasing income tax, uh, national insurance or VAT. What the Prime Minister is doing. He's got, he's got a manifesto that's got promises to you and everybody watching 
which are unfunded because his Chancellor has said that the money he's relying on has already been spent. Now that is the mistake that Liz Truss made. That's what cost so many people so much across this country. And now we've got to repeat unfunded commitments, lots of promises, 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 promises. But where's the money coming from? The Chancellor himself has said the money was spent last year. It isn't available. That's a rep And if there's five more years of this, okay. we're going to have the same as we've got now, a cost of living crisis bearing down on people across this country, really struggling because the economy is broken. And this is the chance at this election to turn the page and start to re build our country with a stable economy. So many things to say about that, but one, could you hear the protesters outside? This was in Nottingham mm. that the BBC put them together. Two, has there ever been a Labour leader in history who's looked more like a City of London banker? Well, he, was, he, he, he looks the part God, for Downing Street, doesn't I mean, he? Do you remember Michael... F you won't remember Michael... F he, 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 went to the, he got in trouble because he going to the Cenotaph for the um, commemoration of the two world wars in a donkey jacket. Um, we've had Neil Kinnock, you know... Man of the people in many ways, brilliant politician in many ways. I've never seen Blair, you know, I suppose he looked like a banker as well, didn't he? But well, there's a lot in the imaging. There's, there's nothing there's to scare the, the City imaging. of London or investors. You make absolutely the right point as well. Look, the two leaders were also asked whether they would change the UK's trading... Well, this is important. Would they change the UK's trading relationship with the EU? We're not rejoining the single market or the customs union, but we're not accepting freedom of movement. But I'm not a Will defeat... Will you accept I'm the not, migration uh, in any form? Please, let me finish answering the question. I'm not a defeatist like the Prime Minister who says to Julie, bad luck, that's as good as it gets, you'll have to go along with the problems you've got, however hard that is for you. I'm not in that. I'm not going to say to you, Julie, there's nothing I can do to help you or to other people in the same position. I'm going to say, I know we can get a better deal than the botched deal that we've got, and I'm going to go out and fight for it. Not going to have freedom of movement come back, not going to go back into the EU, but I'm going to fight so, for a better deal so you can trade more easily so, across Europe, so you can succeed, and our economy can succeed, because I believe in our country. So, in, 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 the, in, the 18 months, in the 18 months I've had the job, I've negotiated with the EU, you for the Windsor framework, restored the government in Northern Ireland and strengthened our union, made sure that we are part of the Horizon scheme on positive terms, warmly welcomed by the entire research community or universities. I've got a track record of doing those deals with the EU, but you just say you'll get a deal. What, what will it cost? You're not being straight with people. I know what it will cost is more migration. He's not being straight with you. You think you're just magic magic some good thing for us and they won't want something in return right it's just again you're taking people for fools they've been crystal clear the price of any of those things is greater migration well there's clearly a potential crisis at the top of politics but enough about macron and Scholz. let's speak about the uk uh carlston nickel is deputy director of research at tenio simple question what did you learn last night not much <laughs> <laughs> okay let's move on i mean um, the price the price for for, to pay for joining the customs union, the single market's migration, but I think we've been talking about that for a couple of years now, right? I think, but the Prime Minister is obviously right, um, uh, reminding uh, viewers about, about that fact. Mm. Uh, short of that, you're talking about what? You're talking about some technical stuff, maybe around product standards, to maybe reduce border controls a little bit in the margins, that kind of stuff. Is that the answer to the UK's economic problems? I doubt it. Um. It's a very strange situation, isn't it, where you've got leaders at the top of British politics unsure or, or seemingly very sure that having a very hardline stance on relations with Europe is a vote winner. Do we not want better relations at an arm's distance with uh, Europe? Isn't that the whole point of breakfast? Or do we... Uh, uh, Brexit. Breakfast is another issue. Uh, <laughs> Still ahead you of can you. tell what I'm thinking about. One's ahead of you, one's behind you. <laughs> Haven't had my revolting smoothie yet. But, 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 but do we want... Because, because I've mentioned this because reform are picking up a lot of seats, potentially. No, a lot of votes, not seats. A lot of votes by saying we need a more of a scorched earth policy with Europe. Rishi Sunak is saying we've kept Europe at arm's length. We do not have a closer relationship with them. And... Sir Keir Starmer is saying we're not going to bring back the, um, the, the single market or, or freedom of movement as well. Getting points for not having a closer relationship with Europe, it's, it's an extraordinary situation. Yeah, nerdy political scientist answer to that. I think it really boils down to that specific electoral system, the first past the post system that we have here, right? And which is very special by, by European standards, right? Which forces, of course, the Conservatives as they're up against electoral wipeout to go after those voters who are considering 
going over to, to reform and which forces the Labour Party to look after the median voter, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to win back some of those red wall constituencies, the stuff that we were talking about in the last election five years ago, you obviously have to take that into account and have to keep silent on the, on the European question, not making, making a stronger, more positive pitch. I, I just, just, I, I've studied Europe and the Tories, genuinely studied it for almost all my life. Uh, no, not when I was five, but, but, but you know, when I was a teenager onwards. Uh, and it's never been a vote winner in many ways. You know, yes. it, it's I, been I torturous. To get into that. What exactly are people voting on? Because the, the polling tells you with the amount of protest votes or, or votes swinging towards the smaller parties, it's small individual issues or a general feeling of protesting that people are going to take to the polls with them. What do you think is going to be the number one box ticker for voters when they come to poll polling day? I think the question is whether there's really protest vote or whether it's, um, it's that realignment that we were talking about five years ago on a much, on a much larger, larger scale now, right? We might well be coming out of that election, uh, ending up with the Liberal Democrats uh, with larger numbers in, in, in Parliament than the Conservatives. Does, does, that, does that mean that, look at that chart. Yeah. The, the interesting thing isn't necessarily the ridiculous line at the top. The interesting exactly. thing is lines two and three. Are you saying that Ed Davey now gets to sit opposite um, that Sakir Starmer, of course. if that's right, in that scenario, and the Tories get pushed the, to the side. In that scenario, he's the, leader of the, he's the leader of the opposition, right? So topics such as migration, for instance, the relationship, uh, the, the relationship with Europe um, uh, and so on, I mean, that's, again, that's a result of the specific electoral system that we spend so much time on that, when really we should be talking about a new economic model for this country, the question of productivity, and that obviously doesn't get the attention that it should. No, it doesn't, and we are in the final stages of this uh, election. As we look at those numbers, and as we sit back and say, are the polls right? We've been in this situation before, where come polling day and the wash up of the election, the polls have had it wrong before. Is there a chance that the polls are way off this time too? I think the real question to watch is how big is that majority going to be? How big is that conservative wipeout going to be? So yes, to your point, can we be 100% sure about that? I doubt it. But I think the overall picture that Sergei Starmer is most likely to be the prime minister in a week from now and that Labour will be at least with a decent majority in Westminster, that looks like a given by Can now. I bring up the sentiment in the debate? Uh, there was a, a point made that it was very different to three weeks ago when ITV had the other debate. Uh, this time round, you saw um, this underdog status used by Rishi Sunak. A, does it work? And B, was there a prime ministerial look from Keir Starmer that also then works as a we count down to polling day? I think the country is getting used to the idea of him as a, as a prime minister, right, increasingly over the last couple of, last couple of weeks. The underdog uh, uh, fighting back, well, I mean, if you look at these uh, post-debate polls, 50-50, is that really enough? If we know one thing about TV debates is, you know, if it's really close between two sides, then, then, then that kind of stuff can matter if one candidate puts in a really strong performance. Okay. I'm not sure whether we're in that scenario, to be totally honest. Um, there was a phenomenon that the pollsters got badly wrong on Brexit and Trump, uh, and that is that there was the almost the embarrassed voter or the actually I quite like the idea of Brexit or I quite like Trump but I don't want to admit it to the pollsters. Is that possible that there is, talking about the underdog status, that there is a secret Tory vote? I don't want to admit to anyone I'm voting Tory but actually I'm going to vote Tory. Not me by the way, this is, I'm not voting for anyone at this moment. But, but yeah, is that what I'm saying? Is there, is like the, the pollsters, because I've had uh, Lord Dominic Johnson from the Tories sitting here, we had uh, Alistair Campbell from the Labour Party on, on Zoom, and both of them said they don't believe the polls. Yeah, I mean, the, the famous shy Tory effect, right, which in this country we've yeah. seen in elections going back uh, several decades, really. Um, I, I don't know if, if, if it's really down to the question of not wanting to answer it in, in, in the polls. Um, I think the question is really how many people are worried about this scenario that we've just been talking about complete wipeout for the Conservative Party and what that does kind of over the longer term to the party system in the UK. Is that going to focus minds in the core Conservative electorate when they're looking in these key marginal anything. seats? When the Whigs disappeared and then the Liberals after, who was the last Liberal Prime Minister? Was it uh, David Lloyd George? Was it? I, I, and then you know, Ramsay McDonald won in the 20s, then you never saw Labour again for years. I, I don't know. But are you, are you willing to make that decision on Sunday? Or are you saying, well, perhaps the Conservatives could do with five or perhaps even 10 years in, in opposition, right? I think that's a, that's a different magnitude um, uh, of, of the impact that we Can could I be looking at here. Can I bring up the latest scandal? There's always a scandal in the, at some point over an election campaign. Mm -hmm. This time it's a betting scandal 
What's the consequence of that scandal and how significant do you think this one's been? To me, the main consequence of that scandal is that, again, we're not talking about policy issues that we should be talking about, right? I mean, first we had that fallout from that uh, fateful decision to leave the uh, D-Day commemorations uh, early by the Prime Minister, a lot of, lot, of noise around, lot of noise around that. Now we have this scandal and I think time is, time is ticking basically for the Conservatives. It's just testament to the fact that the party is really struggling to get through to voters with anything on substance. Well, let's talk about the economy because you did put the ball on the tee before and, and what this means. Is it pivotal that we get the right strategy in place now? Because it feels as though we've got lots of moving pieces, AI, we've got industrial policy being rethought in many countries from the United States to Europe. How key is it that Labour gets its policy right if it is elected? Yes, it is, it is absolutely key. And in that sense, the, the new UK government, the incoming UK government is not different from, from, from other places in Europe. I mean, we see very comparable questions in France, in Germany, in Italy, of course, um, in, in other places across the continent. The question here, as elsewhere in Europe is, do you have the fiscal space to do what, what would have to be done? And if you don't, then what does that do to taxation? And in that sense, I mean, at least that is something that came up yesterday, and I think rightly so, the taxation question. Super chat. Thank you very much indeed. You, you almost, well, you did. You succeeded in impossible, making British politics interesting. Well done. Thank you very much indeed for that. Carlson Nickel, deputy, <laughs> it's your job, I guess. Uh, Carlson Nickel, the deputy director of research at Tenio. Well, the company is always political. Trust me, I, I was speaking to John Brown 25 years ago. It was always political. The new BP CEO, Murray Orkincloss, has reportedly imposed a hiring freeze at the energy giant with new offshore wind projects put on pause. That according to Reuters, citing sources at the company. Reuters frames the move as part of a renewed emphasis on oil and gas amid shareholder dissatisfaction over the company's energy transition strategy. CNBC is reaching out to BP for comment. Coming up on the show, markets are on intervention watch with Japanese authorities on high alert amid a plunging yen. We'll have the latest after the break. Plus, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang addresses shareholders laying out his strategy to maintain the chip giant's market-leading status. We'll bring you his views on the firm's AI advantage. And Curry's earnings are set to cross the wires at 8 CET. Don't miss our first on CMC conversation with the CEO, Alex Baldock. That's the next hour. Ambition to me is about doing better. I think ambition creates a pathway. The best advice I can give someone starting off a career is don't have a career, have lots of careers, try loads of different things. Talk to people and put your ambition out there. I don't feel that I've hit peak ambition because it's a learning journey. CNBC is where ambition meets opportunity. What does living ambitiously mean to you? Hear it from our CNBC anchors, reporters and global business leaders on CNBC.com. Wow, look at this. We are on intervention watch again after Japan's finance minister said he's ready to act to boost a falling yen. Look at that five-year chart. I, I personally think it's extraordinary. We're not talking about some Mickey Mouse currency here or some aggressive, in the old words, third world currency. Now we'd say emerging world as well. No, it, it, authorities admit they are seriously concerned and on high alert with the currency languishing at a fresh 38-year low against the greenback. The chief cabinet secretary said Tokyo will take appropriate action. Really? Well, that's what they say, but will they? With the moves adding to pressure on the Bank of Japan ahead of its next policy meeting at the end of July. Lynn, this is just extraordinary. I, I presume it's making huge waves in your part of the world. Yeah, exactly. Good morning to you, Steve. And as you've just highlighted there, we are seeing that jawboning coming through yet again from a number of these Japanese officials, but uh, not much support coming through for the yen during the Asian session. And many analysts putting that down to the fact that perhaps we've all heard it all before and that markets are now just used to it and perhaps calling the bluff of the authorities here. In terms of sort of where to from here, uh, one analyst 
analyst I spoke to, I think, put it best because he said that this is a BOJ and a Ministry of Finance problem with a Fed solution because when you look at that yawning interest rate differential, this is a problem that a lot of the Asian currencies in this neck of the woods are dealing with, uh, that that basically constrains the BOJ and they're, they're very much watching uh, for what the Fed is going to do. Certainly data really key at the moment with the uh, core PCE coming through on Friday. But, uh, you know, that is sort of where a lot of the problems are. But in terms of the Japanese side, certainly, uh, you know, there is short of intervention. Uh, there is this talk of a potential rate check. That's when the BOJ uh, would call through to some of these dealers and basically warn them against betting uh, against the yen. And that is often seen as a precursor to direct intervention. But uh, I guess throwing it forward, we've got the BOJ meeting in July. It's still four and a half weeks from now, but uh, certainly there's a view forming in the market that perhaps we could get that one-two punch, that there will be this uh, easing in terms of the QE, but also potentially a rate hike as well. Uh, but, you know, when we look at the Japanese economy and also the, you know, the weakness of the yen, there is certainly the view that even if there is a, a rate hike and there is that uh, aggressive tapering of bond purchases, uh, that, you know, it might not really turn the tide here that we need a succession of uh, these rate hikes and we need the Fed to be cutting at the same time. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at the Japanese economy, it's certainly still very fragile. We got retail sales uh, this morning. It surprised to the upside, but a lot of that coming through from uh, the inbound tourism, from that weak yen, because, you know, consumers and households in Japan still dealing, of course, uh, with, you know, concerns around inflation and the concerns around imported inflation, uh, which, of course, is the, the key concern here. Guys. So many things you said, Lynn, which just resonate. Thank you so much for uh, putting the ball on the tee for Karen and I to knock it around a bit as well. Do you knock a ball around if you put it on the tee? Maybe it's a different sport. It depends how badly you play. <laughs> um, I think this is extraordinary, and I think it's hilarious. In fact, crazy that the MOF is saying, oh, it's speculative. When the fundamentals are MOF, I, I, there I tell you, how about monetary policy, you have an interest rate of 0 to 0.1%. America land has an interest rate of 5.25%, give or take the change. Do you not think this is something to do with something more fundamental that we've been talking about for decades? Carry, perhaps? No? Okay. So have a look at this. This is my next point. There is a chart. There, there, there's a lot of you out there who love technical charts. I don't understand technical analysis, but I appreciate it plays a large part in your analysis. So the, the team over, and wait for it, Adam, uh, the, the team over at Bank of America have been looking at the chart and what it shows you as well. This is why I think this is an unbelievably fascinating level. We are currently at circa 1990 highs for the dollar, there or thereabouts, you know, there's different levels. The 1986 high for the greenback is 164 and a half. Where do you think the next level is on the chart, according to Bank of America? Shall I show you? Adam, let's show them. You want to read that? You've got to look up from your toothpaste, <laughs> from brushing, from shaving. Don't cut yourself. Above this level, there appears to be no clear historical resistance below 200. Personally, I, humble me, find that staggering for a major global currency, one of the key basket currencies in the world. Can, I, can we take it with a grain of salt? I mean, it touched the 160.88 mark overnight for the first time in 38 years. So if there's been no history over 38 years, what are the support barriers? Because there haven't really been anything. Okay. Any, so, so what is the technical analysis in this context? Well, I mean, I, I do trust the, the, the ladies and gentlemen over at Bank of America to have done their research on this one. Again, I did make the point. I, I'm not a technical analysis aficionado, but I appreciate it plays a role in many of our viewers. But, but, but don't you think it's extraordinary? that the Bank of Japan is still talking in terms of this is speculative, this is speculative. Nothing to do with the economic... If you're speculating, then you are not taking into consideration and making a rational decision on the economic fundamentals. And the economic fundamentals... We'll come to the US later because we've done some great work on this as well today. The economic fundamentals are the Japanese have inflation at target but a 0% to 0.1% interest rate. And uh, the Americans have a strong economy at the moment with 
uh, interest rate at five and a quarter. Well, that is not speculative. That to, is fundamental. To the point around the macro, I think the market is concerned that we've got inflation at target, but it may not be staying there. And the, the Japanese are giving us a I'm message of a, of a lack of confidence. So, so potentially, as we come up to the end of the quarter, you've got some selling as the market looks to the next quarter. A little bit disappointed around that macro. But some of the oddities here, you've got still appetite for the Japanese stock market. And you've seen in the last number of sessions, there's been more buying back in that market. Today is a bit off around the technology story, but there has genuinely been, again, more interest in the Japanese stock market. So why is the currency falling in that context? That's somewhat of an oddity. Uh, but what happens next, I think, is key. If this is all movement by large funds, what's coming for the next quarter? What exactly are people positioning for is what I'm interested in? And what do authorities do on the back of that? Because there's been a view of these uh, targeted interventions so far. The South Koreans have been doing the same thing, trying to send a message. But for the Japanese, that message is simply not working. So do they have to step it up? Do we need more hawkish language? It feels like there's got to be a strategy shift in the next quarter from the Japanese. Yeah, the Japanese dollar earners, you know, they're, they're pretty much immune to the weakness, i.e. You know, dollar improving, they're earning their money in dollars, great. Translation back into yen looks more flattering as well. So you know, there are counterpoints on that. Um, incredible fall on the Hang Seng as well, I noticed. Yeah, so what we've got, uh, technology names just picking up on some of the news flow from Micron overnight and some of the weakness and outlook on revenue that's impacted technology stocks across in the Asian market. So Japanese stocks down 1% today, a little bit more coming off Hong Kong, uh, down to the tune of almost 400 points or well over 2%. Six tens plus down for stocks out of Shanghai. So real reading day across the region, three quarters of a percent down for Australia. Let's take a look at those U.S. markets because you think it'd be stemming from there, but it's simply not. Wall Street again bouncing along. More tech trades in focus. So we saw yesterday a couple of big name stocks. It was Amazon's turn to move its market cap through uh, another trillion dollar layer, two trillion for the first time. Uh, this uh, joining a handful of those big tech companies as we saw the bounce in that uh, share price. But of course, bolstering the fortunes of the S&P 500 and also the Nasdaq. But uh, that said, after hours, we did have a miss from Micron. This was on the revenue outlook. And uh, don't forget another player right at the forefront of AI. Unfortunately, that's coming at the expense of other parts of the business. Smartphones and the PC market sluggish for Micron. So uh, that was a bit of a disappointing factor in the after hours trade for that stock, but having consequences for the market. More broadly, we were looking at NVIDIA yesterday on the back of its AGM, a quarter of a percent higher. Stronger trades, though, really around Apple and Tesla. Those were the two big moving names in the tech basket. Thank you for listening to Squawk Box Europe Express. For more market moving news, you can head to cnbc.com. Or join us again on the show with Steve Sedgwick, Karen Cho and myself, Arabi Lekumete, weekdays on CNBC.